the Persona series. It's now a beloved franchise among JRPG fans and gamers alike, but it didn't start out that way. Personally, I think these games have always been great for different reasons, and I'm going to be explaining why throughout the rest of this video series, to the best of my ability of course. When trying to give a definitive overview of the series, starting with this first game doesn't really cut it. We're lacking context. We need to go beyond and dive a bit into its parent franchise, Megami Tensei. The first entry in the series was released in 1987 for the Famicom and PC, titled Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei, named after the successful trilogy of novels it was based on. The game scenario was written by the novel's author, Aya Nishitani, and is based on the third novel in the series. It follows a high school prodigy that invents a computer program that can summon demons. With a party of demons at his disposal, he descends into a massive labyrinth to oppose the demon lord Lucifer and his generals. The gameplay consisted of exploring dungeons in a first-person perspective, and dealing with the numerous random encounters along the way. It was this game that introduced many of the series' mainstays, such as negotiating with demons, fusing multiple demons together to create stronger demons, and an alignment system, something that was fairly common in Western RPGs at the time. This basic formula would carry over into its sequel, Megami Tensei 2, which wasn't based on any pre-existing source material, nor was Nishitani involved in its creation in any capacity. It would introduce a new setting that was unique to its genre, a post-apocalyptic Tokyo ravaged by a demon invasion. A couple more of the series' mainstays are introduced here. The player can now make choices throughout the story that will affect their alignment and result in different endings. Following the success of Megami Tensei 2, Atlas decided to reboot the series, and reinterpret Nishitani's source material. It's here where the series would drift even further from those initial novels and take on its own identity, an identity that was uniquely Atlas. This is reflected in the new name, Shin Megami Tensei, which translates into English as True Reincarnation of the Goddess a reference to the reincarnated Izanami from the novel trilogy and first Megami Tensei game. Izanami! This game would also have a post-apocalyptic setting and a huge emphasis on character alignment, only this time alignments weren't as black and white. In addition to light and dark, the player was now able to choose between law, chaos and neutrality, all of which led to different endings. This game would get a slew of sequels and become an extremely popular franchise in its own right, continuing to this very day. However, we're here to explore the origins of Persona, and to do so we'll need to look at a particular entry in this series, the third game, titled Shin Megami Tensei If. As its name suggests, it's a what-if story, taking place in an alternate timeline where the apocalypse established in the first game never happened. It would take many of the same elements the series was known for, but with an inventive twist. It would take place in a modern-day school setting with normal high school students as its cast. These ideas would become the basis for a sequel franchise, called Megami Imbunroku Persona. I say sequel and not spin-off since the two games do share the same continuity. The protagonist from IF, Tameki Yoshida, appears as a minor character in the first Persona title, where she is canonically established to be female, a choice that was left up to the player in that particular game. So at last we arrive at the title I'm going to be delving deeper into over these next few videos. Discussing the origins of Persona can become a little overwhelming, just because of the sheer amount of material it draws influence from. Just to reiterate, there's the novel trilogy which the Megami Tensei games will be based on, and then there's the Shin Megami Tensei games which takes influence from both of those sources. Persona introduces even more sources with its inclusion of Jungian psychology, as we'll explore later in this video. It's worth mentioning that you don't need to know any of this to enjoy these games. Atlas always intended them to be standalone experiences. What little continuity these games do have is inconsequential, and trying to make sense of its convoluted timeline is a fool's errand. Each game was meant to be a gateway for a new generation of JRPG fan. In this video series, I'll be analysing the story and gameplay of every Persona title, I'll be comparing them only to material that existed when each game was released. I won't be using material introduced in Persona 2 to elaborate on the story of Persona 1, for example. Quite simply, that game didn't exist yet, and there's no proof to suggest that they planned these games with a grander picture in mind. 
Looking at the lore as a whole might be a fun experiment for a future video series, but for now, let's tackle them one at a time. This first part of my analysis will focus on the story, characters and themes. There will be a story summary for those lacking context. I understand that not many people have played this game or have much desire to do so. Hopefully I'll be able to change that by the end of this three part series. The second part will be a review of the gameplay and a thorough examination of its mechanics. And finally, the third part will be focused on the PSP re-release, and will be an analysis of the Snow Queen quest. Its omission within this first video is because, well, it's not in the PlayStation version, and that's the version these first couple videos are analysing. Those of you who have already seen my The Botch Localization of Persona video may already be familiar with this aspect, but fear not, because part 3 will also be covering the details that weren't mentioned in that video. Since the original Western release of this game is what we'll be examining for now, it only makes sense that we start with its Western origins. Now then, sit back, get comfy and relax, for the journey has only just begun. Let us delve inside of the Ultimate Persona Compendium, and read what fate has in store for the residents of this Velvet Room. In 1991, the company now known as Atlas USA would be established in California. It started as a small-time publisher that would bring over and localise various titles from its parent company. However, these titles would not include their successful Megami Tensei games, at least not at first. The reasons for this have never been revealed, so we can only speculate. It's likely its themes were thought to be too controversial for the US at the time. The 1980s saw the rise of a phenomenon known as the Satanic Panic. Hysteria about the practice of Satanism and occult rituals were rampant, and this led to many bits of media being unfairly labelled as Satanic. This included movies, music, and tabletop RPGs such as Dungeons and Dragons. Take the pieces of the game, they would throw them in the incinerator or the fireplace, and screams would come out because there seemed to be some kind of spiritual forces inhabiting those pieces. It's not out of the realm of possibility that the Megami Tensei games, a series about summoning demons, would also garner the same kind of controversy, even a decade later in the mid-90s. The series' high level of difficulty and niche appeal may have also been factors, of course. Some of the games Atlas did publish during this time were less risky ventures, such as the platformer Rocking Cats on the NES, and the adventure game Virtual Hydlide for the Saturn. It wouldn't be until 95 that they would bring over a real Megami Tensei game, and even this was far from a conventional title in the series. Jack Bros was a platformer for the Virtual Boy that featured Atlas's mascot Jack Frost as a playable character. The following year, they announced they would be bringing over a traditional turn-based RPG, titled Devil Summoner for the Sega Saturn. Various game publications at the time were quite excited about this. After all, it would be the first Atlas RPG to make it to English-speaking regions. Sadly, this release never happened, and the game was quietly cancelled. The reasons for this are unclear. Saturn World reported at the time that it was cancelled because of questionable content, which may confirm my earlier theory about the Satanic Panic. I mean, the game is literally called Devil Summoner. Sadly, I can't confirm this, so we may never know why this release was cancelled. Still, Atlas were determined to introduce the Megami Tensei series to the West. They lacked a flagship franchise in the US. And with other JRPGs such as Final Fantasy doing so well, they were eager to capitalise. 
And so, during the third quarter of 96, Atlas released the first true Megami Tensei title in English. Revelations Persona It was a risky project. Atlas had never tackled a localization job of this scale before. With it being an RPG, the game featured a great deal of menus and cutscenes that had to be translated. This wasn't a simple arcade-style game where the text was inconsequential. Understanding its complicated gameplay mechanics and story would be vital. This huge job was given to a small team of only six people, whose jobs it was to not only translate the game, but somehow make it marketable for a Western audience. Persona's unique high school setting would be one of its selling points, but also made it much more difficult to westernize. Most JRPGs of the time took heavy influence from Western fantasy. Not only this, but they would have settings that were far removed from the real world. This meant that there was less of a cultural barrier for audiences. No matter who was playing it, the world was self-contained and worked under its own internal logic. Persona was a strange beast indeed. Its real-world setting ironically made it less relatable to players in the United States. So Atlas made the decision to change many aspects of the game to counteract this. Instead of the fictional Japanese town of Mikagecho, the game would take place in an American town called Luna Vale. The game would also receive a title change to Revelations Persona. This was their attempt to establish consistent branding for Megami Tensei in the West. The back of the game's box advertised this fact, writing that it is the first chapter of the Revelations series. The Revelations name would be used again in 99 for Revelations the Demon Slayer, known as Megami Tensei Gaiden Last Bible in Japan. This name would be scrapped altogether in the next Persona game, and later replaced with the more fateful Shin Megami Tensei, starting with Nocturne in 2004. It turns out Atlas were somewhat justified in their concerns that the series would attract controversy in the West, although they didn't exactly help themselves with the biblical allusions of the Revelations title. According to Atlas marketing manager Gail Salamanca, the company had calls accusing them of devil worship. This version of the game was an important first step for both the series in the West and Atlas USA. Nevertheless, it's mostly remembered these days for its less than ideal translation and deviations from the Japanese version. The localization changes are numerous. They affect not just story and dialogue, but also the gameplay. Specific examples will be examined later in this video series, particularly when we take a look at the more fateful PSP version of the game. For the next couple parts, however, we'll be proceeding as if we have no such comparison. So, what is Revelations Persona? The actual story begins with a group of students after school playing something called the Persona game a strange rumour that had been circulating St. Hermelin High. It involves walking around the classroom and calling out to your persona. While playing the game, they catch a brief glimpse of a little girl before being knocked out by lightning. While unconscious, they meet a mysterious masked man named Philemon. He delivers a speech here that lays the foundations of the entire franchise. Persona, the power to call on others within you. Sometimes merciful, Sometimes cruel, these cells are embedded deep within your soul. The idea of the persona and Philemon himself are drawn from another source, the psychology of Carl Jung. Since his ideas are heavily woven into this game's themes, some explanation is in order. Carl Gustav Jung was an influential psychologist and psychiatrist of the early 20th century. Like Sigmund Freud, who he was formerly partnered with, he had a fascination with the unconscious mind. He introduced the theory of the collective unconscious, the idea that the human psyche was more than a blank slate shaped by its environment. Unlike the personal unconscious, which consisted of every thought and memory experienced by the individual, the collective unconscious is shared by all human beings. It's an ancestral memory containing inherited patterns of behavior. These are known as archetypes, Archetypes are inborn tendencies that shape the human ego. They're abstract modes of expression that can be found represented in art, myths, and dreams. To put it into simpler terms, they're the recognizable roles that are found in all of fiction, such as the naive hero who must combat adversity, or the wizened master who must train him. 
Jung saw the concept of archetypes as a determining force for behaviour that would guarantee some level of similarity in people. There are many important archetypes that are relevant to this analysis, but let's start with the most obvious one. The Persona. The term Persona comes from the Roman period and refers to an actor's mask that would be worn during a performance. Within Jungian psychology, the Persona is a metaphorical mask, worn to hide an individual's true self. It's an artificial personality that is assumed when dealing with the world. Examples of this can be found absolutely everywhere. The mannerisms a person uses at work is going to be vastly different from when they're with friends or family. The purpose behind the persona is to repress socially unacceptable personality traits. Jung wrote that the persona is, as its name implies, only a mask of the collective psyche, a mask that feigns individuality, making others and oneself believe that one is individual, whereas one is simply acting a role through which the collective psyche speaks. Fundamentally, the persona is nothing real. It is as compromised between individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. This raises an important question. Who are we really? Which of these personas is closest to our true self, if any of them at all? If the persona is a role placed on us by society and ourselves, its authenticity is highly questionable. So what is the true self operating behind this mask? Jung believed that it was something at the very centre of the psyche, beyond the realms of consciousness. This is one of the many archetypes, and is the unification of the consciousness and unconsciousness. The Self The realisation of the self is the ultimate self-discovery. Only after having a larger understanding of their personas, shadow and ego, can a person truly come to realise a self, a much richer and complete image of themselves. The entire plot of this game can be read as a journey to mankind's true potential, and by extension, the self. However, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The persona power in this game is very similar to the archetype of the same name, only it's a real supernatural force. Overcoming different situations requires use of multiple personas. The player will need to make regular visits to the Velvet Room to create new ones. Each persona differs in strength, weaknesses, stats and skills. It's a parallel to the personas these characters use in their everyday lives to get by, and this couldn't be more appropriate for high school students, an age group that is still discovering themselves and finding their place in the world. The power of persona is the ability to call upon archetypes from the collective unconscious. This is why they're represented by demons, gods and other mythological figures. While it's true that this idea originates from previous Megami Tensei games, their inclusion here carries a different meaning. Each of these personas represents an archetypal story. The characters aren't actually summoning real gods and demons, as awesome as that would be. What is being summoned is their collective meaning to humanity. Mythology and psychology are closely tied, and this has been the focus of much of Jung's writings. He argued that all of the world's mythologies are a projection of the collective unconscious and its archetypes. For example, the Norse god Loki, who can be summoned in the game, is an expression of the trickster archetype. The trickster is devious and breaks rules and conventions. They rebel against authority and are often in equal measures intelligent as they are deceitful. I don't know what that is, but it certainly didn't exist back in 96. There are many other expressions of the trickster in mythology, and that's only one archetype. Mythological tales may follow gods as their protagonists, but they were written by people and are expressions of human nature. Up until now I've been talking about the personas that our human cast can summon, but this also applies to most of the enemies they encounter as well. They too originate from the collective unconscious within the game's universe. The reasons for this become evident as we progress through the plot. It's also worth mentioning that this explains the appearance of fictional characters in Persona, such as the numerous Lovecraftian monsters. The most notable of these is Nyala Fotep, the Crawling Chaos. It becomes the persona of Guido Sardinia, the game's antagonist, and represents the very worst aspects of humanity. It's time we continued with the story and gave something of an overview. We now know the Jungian roots of the premise, but where does the story go with it? After their initial encounter with Philemon, 
the cast make their way across town to visit their sick friend Mary, who was hospitalised over a year ago because of mental delusions. During their visit, she has a mental episode, and a strange event takes place that deforms a hospital, and causes the appearance of zombies and other supernatural creatures. This isn't isolated to just the hospital either, all of Lunavale is under siege by demons. The gang leaves the hospital when they hear that Mary's mother, Nancy, is injured and taking refuge at a local shrine. Apparently she had been shot by a member of the Seabeck Corporation while trying to escape. Nancy worked as an engineer at Seabeck and had been working on the Davis system, a reality warping machine responsible for the supernatural events around the town. The man in charge of this project is named Guido Sardinia, the president of Seabeck. Using Nancy's security card, the gang plan to sneak into the Seabeck building to put a stop to Guido's schemes. They temporarily retreat back to the school, only to encounter none other than Mary, who they are shocked to find is no longer sick. She also doesn't remember the last year she spent in the hospital either. She joins the party and confronts Guido with the others. And we find out that Guido plans to annihilate the entire human race using the Davis system. The inventor of the Davis system, Dr. Nicholas, attempts to destroy the machine with himself and Guido trapped inside. However, this is prevented by the sudden appearance of a little girl in black. The party is transported to a parallel world that closely resembles their own. Here they meet Bruce, a student that had also been thrown into the other world by the little girl in black. He went missing a couple months ago with his girlfriend Selena. It's at this point the party learns the truth behind Mary's recovery and lost memories. She's not the same Mary from the hospital at all. She originated from this parallel world, a world in which she was never hospitalised. The party confronts the little girl in black, Maggie, and demand that she stop terrorising everyone in the other world. This ends with her sicking a giant robot rat on them. We once again meet with Philemon, who gives a handy explanation of their current situation for both the characters and player. Guido has taken over the east side of town and is looking for something. If he finds it, there will be no tomorrow for either your world or the world you're in now. It proves difficult getting to Guido with all the traps laid by Maggie. When the party finally arrives at the black market, they're trapped inside by a magical barrier. They're told by the frightened residents that the Harem Queen has made the location her domain and has enslaved everyone as servants. This Harem Queen turns out to be the missing Selina. She had been using a magic mirror given to her by Maggie to grant any wish she desires. This happened because of intense jealousy she felt towards Mary. Not only was she a better artist, but her boyfriend Bruce was originally in love with her. She uses the magic mirror so she can threaten everyone into praising her so she can feel superior to Mary. The magic granted by Maggie isn't without consequences, however, as each time she uses it, moles grow on her face and tarnish her beauty. This curse is broken when Bruce accepts her in spite of these flaws. Selina tells the party that Maggie is in a magical castle across town, which they can't get into without first obtaining a half-moon compact as a key. It's located in a gingerbread house in the manor forest, and is held by a little girl in white named May, who tells the party that Maggie is an evil version of her. May says that she created the other world with a compact, which has now been split into two. One half is held by May and the other by Maggie, who has been using its powers for evil purposes. They convince May to give them the other half of the compact so they can confront Guido, but this turns out to be exactly what he wants. The party inadvertently gives Guido the full compact, allowing him to take control of the Chaos Mirror and travel between dimensions at will. Guido returns to the original world and turns Seabeck into a fortress, the Devayuga, one fit for the god he now believes himself to be. The party confront Guido for the final time, only to find that he has become completely apathetic after accomplishing his goals. The party goad him into a battle anyway that he ultimately loses. On his deathbed, he reveals the secret of the two worlds. The other world is a product of Mary's imagination brought on by her link to the Davis system. Somehow, her psychic waves synchronized with the machine and manifested her heart's desires, creating an ideal world based on the town from before she was hospitalized. This is foreshadowed at the start of the game with the toy blocks in Mary's room. They're placed in the shape of St. Hermelin High. Each Mary, including May, Maggie and the ideal Mary in the party, are all fragments of the real Mary's psyche. 
Realising what she had done, the ideal Mary uses the Chaos Mirror to return to the world inside of herself, where she plans to remain until she dies. The gang don't believe her to be at fault, however, so they use a fragment of the Chaos Mirror and once again meet with Mei in the Otherworld. She informs them that Maggie is trying to erase the Otherworld with the help of another fragment of Mary's psyche, the most dangerous part of herself that wishes only for nothingness, Pandora. Now that we have a nice synopsis of everything that happens in the story, it's time we delve a little deeper. There are many themes presented here that warrant further analysis. The character Mary is at the core of the story and embodies many of the Jungian archetypes. As we discovered earlier, there's more than one version of Mary. Each one represents a different part of her psyche. Firstly, let's start with the real Mary, the version that vanishes from the hospital at the start of the game. It's not until much later that we learn what happened to this version of her. She was taken to something called the Pool of Man's Mind and Soul, which is buried deep under the shrine in the Otherworld. This area is a literal representation of the collective unconscious, or the Animus Mundi, which is a similar concept. It's a place where all souls are connected, and it's here where the real Mary can be found. Here she voices her nihilistic beliefs that gave birth to Pandora. She wishes that she was never born, and simply wants to do nothing and waste away. The ideal Mary pleads with her to change her mind, putting to her friends as examples for why she's wrong. They've been through a lot, but they never gave up. So who is the ideal Mary? She was created to represent the very best qualities of herself for her perfect world. None of her negative traits would have been needed in this case. If this is sounding familiar, well, it should, because it's very close to the Persona's purpose. The ideal Mary could be seen as a personification of the Persona. However, the main function of the Persona is to repress the Shadow, which brings us to the main conflict of the plot. The mischievous girl in black, Maggie. Both she and Pandora represent Mary's Shadow archetype. I touched on the idea of the Shadow earlier, but here it requires further explanation. The Shadow is the opposite of the Persona, in that it is the repressed parts of the personality deemed unsuitable for the Persona, which is the socially acceptable face we show the world. These personality traits, often extremely negative in nature, are pushed to the subconscious, out of sight. The more the Shadow is ignored or rejected, the more control it will exert over our thoughts and emotions. Jung put it best when he said, That which we do not bring to consciousness appears in our lives as fate. It's only by becoming aware of this part of ourselves that we are able to overcome its destructive influence. It's one of the many obstacles on the journey to realising the self. I know you guys are thinking of Persona 4 right now, but try not to. That game won't exist for another decade. Its usage here, in the form of Maggie, is to illustrate this psychological struggle. Mary's perfect world ignored all of her negative aspects, and in the process gave them much more influence over the world and, by extension, her own psyche. This is why the world is split into two sides when it's explored by the player. One side is almost identical to the real town, and the other side is shrouded in darkness and is filled with Maggie's traps. Maggie is also responsible for bringing all the demons to both this world and the real world, as if they were an invading army. It's a literal battle of the psyche. Next we have Mei. It's difficult to nail down what Mei is meant to represent in Jung's model of the psyche, and that's because I don't think she's from Jungian psychology. Mei seems to fit into the Freudian model of the psyche, which has three distinct aspects. The id, the ego, and the superego. The id is instinctual and only seeks pleasure. It's considered the most primitive and irrational part of the personality. It has no regard for the real-world consequences of its desires. The ego is much more realistic in its desires as it is the part of the personality that has been shaped by the external world. The ego seeks pleasure, but unlike the id, it takes the consequences of its actions into account. The superego is the moral aspect of the personality. Its main purpose is to repress the selfish instincts of the id, and the pragmatism of the ego. The superego strives for moral purity, even if it means putting oneself in harm's way. This is the aspect of the Freudian model that May is meant to represent. It isn't too difficult to figure out how Mary and Maggie relate to this model as well. 
Of course, this means we now have two interpretations of Mary and Maggie. One that fits into the Jungian model, and one that fits into the Freudian model. They don't contradict each other, so there's room for interpretation. And finally, we have Pandora. Pandora is only introduced during the true ending, and isn't mentioned at all in the bad ending. While Maggie was a negative fragment of Mary's psyche, Pandora is something much worse, representing Mary's out-of-control nihilism. As you may have guessed, Pandora's name originates from the Greek myth of Pandora's box. The story goes that Pandora, the first woman created by the gods, had received a jar as a wedding gift containing all of mankind's evils. Pandora was naturally curious, and eventually couldn't resist the urge to open it. In that instant, misery sprung forth from the jar, unleashing death, famine, greed, war, and the rest of mankind's ills. Pandora slammed the jar shut. The last thing that remained in the jar was hope. Something humanity would need to overcome the darkness that now plagued the Earth. The story of Pandora's box can be read as an allegory for the unconscious mind and its contents. Mary's box contained her repressed feelings of nihilism and hate, which were defeated by what was left, hope. Not just the hope held by the ideal Mary, but all of her friends too. Pandora is never really destroyed at the end of the game. After all, those feelings will always be with her. However, she does manage to prove that her hope is more powerful than her despair. This persuades Pandora to release its control over the rest of the psyche and restore Mary's mental state. At the end of the game, we see that Mary's sickness is cured and she is happy once again. Although there are some unresolved plot points in this particular storyline. In the myth, Pandora had received the box from Zeus, who wanted to punish mankind. He knew that Pandora would eventually open the box, as curiosity was one of the gifts given to her by the gods. There's an evil scheme at work here put into motion by Zeus. Is it possible that there's a similar character in the story of Persona? There are a couple parts that are left vague. Why did the Davis system pick up Mary's desire for a perfect world in the first place? It's almost like there's an unseen figure in the story, manipulating things from behind the scenes. Similar to Philemon, only not on the side of humanity. He doesn't believe in mankind's potential and thinks they will ultimately destroy themselves. Something like that. But of course, this is just a theory, and is in no way foreshadowing a future villain in the series. The last character I'll be analysing is one I glossed over earlier. Philemon. Philemon is only partly a creation of Atlas. His real origins are from within the mind of Carl Jung. He recalls first seeing him in one of his dreams, and described his appearance as being that of an old man with the horns of a bull. He believed this figure was not something he intentionally produced. He believed it was something which had a life of its own and brought itself into existence. Philemon represented superior insight to Jung, a sort of spirit guide that taught him about psychological objectivity and the actuality of the soul. In this game, Philemon serves a similar and also more crucial purpose. He acts as a spirit guide for our characters and is an ever-present observer. He doesn't help out the characters in any direct way, but he offers the necessary tools, such as the ability to use personas and create new ones at the Velvet Room. The Velvet Room is the home of Philemon's servants, Igor, Nameless, and Belladonna, whose only purpose is to aid the characters on their journey. Philemon's ultimate goal isn't to ensure anyone's victory. Rather, he believes in the potential of humanity to overcome any odds, and is pushing the characters towards self-enlightenment. Earlier when I mentioned that this entire story could be read as a journey to the self, this is precisely what I was referring to. This is something that Jung referred to as the individuation process. By virtue of this game having a blank slate protagonist, which is essentially a stand-in for the player, this process is left up to the player to make happen. Throughout the story, moral choices are presented to the player. The correct choices, which lead to the game's true ending, are the ones that could be seen as true to oneself. This all culminates in a scene towards the end of the game where the protagonist meets another version of himself, who will congratulate him on sticking to his beliefs. This represents the protagonist's true inner self, the one that stands out amongst the countless personas he holds inside. Interestingly, this version of the protagonist is first seen absorbed in a video game. He doesn't seem too interested in what's going on around him. 
very similar to the person playing this game, no doubt. The message delivered here is quite clear. Be true to yourself, do the right thing, and face your problems head on. This is in stark contrast to the game's bad ending, in which the characters forget about the incident and run away from their inner conflicts. They live on in this ending, but they never realise their true potential. I don't believe making the wrong decisions in this game is a contradiction of what they would do during the true ending. The protagonist doesn't become two different characters depending on the player's choices. Rather, the protagonist loses sight of his true self and makes bad decisions. The journey to the self is about taking responsibility and performing selfless acts. Failing to do these things means the protagonist has proven Philemon wrong. He has failed to realise his full potential and grow as a person. This ties into another important theme introduced in the game's opening FMV, the butterfly motif. This is a quote from Chinese philosopher Zhang Zi. It calls into question objective reality. If we don't know when we're dreaming that we're dreaming, how can we be sure when we're awake? We can never be certain of either of these things. In the context of Persona, this conundrum is referring to who the characters are and who they aren't. The psyche is a complex puzzle and it's easy to mistake the ego for the self. The ego is an expression of the self, but the two are not the same. The ego is not infallible and can be pushed towards dark archetypes, for a variety of reasons. Some of these reasons are presented in the moral choices the protagonist must make throughout the game. The question of whether to abandon the trapped woman and save yourself is a good example. To simplify the difference, the ego is more concerned with survival, while the self is more concerned with altruism. With so many factors at play affecting the psyche, it's easy to become lost and confused. What is the self? The sum of the archetypes and personas within the ego are something more that is yet unseen. It can be impossible to distinguish, just like the distinction between the dreams of a butterfly and the dreams of a man. The butterfly motif is not isolated to this opening quote, however. Philemon takes the form of a golden butterfly at many points in the story. The symbolism here isn't too difficult to figure out. The butterfly represents both the human soul and a metamorphosis into maturity. Essentially, he symbolises the end of the character's journey to self-discovery, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. The smile on your face is no longer a mask, but your true self. No longer do you have to fear when you encounter problems, troubles or pains. Just ask yourself who you are. You now will be able to withstand any adversaries and conflicts that may arise in your life. Go now, into a bright and promising future. 